welcome. It's Tuesday, October 13th, and we are thrilled that you're here with us for the MPA Art Fest Meet the Artist series. We thank heartily our MPA board member and working artist, she's a curator as well, June Linowitz. She's spending time today with two of our MPA Art Fest artists, Rosemary Fight Covey and Vicki Stricker. It's a treat for us to have time with these individual artists and a real benefit of the virtual MPA Art Fest 2020 format. This format has taken a lot of work and it's with the support of BOA, the design build experts here in Tysons who have been in McLean for 32 years and I think supporting us for just about that many. So thank you, we welcome you or welcome you back if you've been with us for others of these talks and we know that you're gonna enjoy this time together. Thank you. Hello and welcome to MPA Art Fest Artist Talks. My name is June Linowitz. I'm a member of the board of the McLean Project for the Arts, and I'm very happy to welcome you to these MPA artist interviews. And to personally introduce you to two fantastic artists who are exhibiting their work as part of MPA Art Fest. As many of you are aware, MPA Art Fest is now in its 14th year. This is a different year because it's the first year that we're virtual. But MPA continues to bring art and community together by offering events, music, artwork, and so much more. This year, MPA Art Fest will be up and running online for two weeks, October 14th through 18th. This year, we've been pleased to receive more applications than usual from artists who want to be included in MPA Art Fest. Of the historic number of entries, we've juried 52 outstanding artists into MPA Art Fest, and we will be featuring their work online. Please do take some time to browse the many virtual studios in the artist section of the website. You can not only see what the artists are producing, you can actually purchase the art. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to two wonderful artists. Rosemary Fate Covey is a renowned printmaker, and Vicki Stricker is an accomplished potter. And so without further ado, I introduce you to Rosemary Fate Covey. Hi, Rosemary. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Can you tell us a bit about your background? Where do you consider uh, home? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Can you tell us a bit well, about your background? Yeah, um, I was born in South Africa, and I grew up there until um, I was about 10 years old, so I'm mainly educated in the United States. Uh, I went to Cornell University for a number of years, and then I went to Maryland Institute of Art. And then I worked for a period of time with a, as a, a, a little bit of an apprentice learning uh, my craft, which was wood engraving, from uh, Barry Mosier, who's a very well-known uh, printmaker. So I was trained very traditionally, <coughs> excuse me, and um, then uh, worked that way, uh, maybe not on traditional subjects, but working in a traditional printmaking manner. And then eventually from doing that for half my career, I started working um, experimentally and taking the, the wood engraving and the printmaking in new directions, which um, much of which will be shown in the MPA show exhibit, some of the newer, more experimental work. I noticed that Cornell has a museum collection of wood engravings. Um, I saw that online. Is that where you learned what started becoming interested? No, um, I really learned uh, wood engraving from uh, a, 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 an artist, going back and working with an artist, Barry Mosier. Um, I had studied with him a bit in high school, but I went back and um, learned the wood engraving from him. At Cornell, I did do a lot of printmaking. Um, I, I was not even aware they had a wood engraving collection. Um, I'm 
part of Georgetown University's permanent collection. They have a huge collection of my prints. Um, so I have worked with Georgetown and feel probably more akin to Georgetown at this point than even to Cornell um, because they have the 550 of my wood engravings and I work there as an artist in residence um, in their medical school uh, working on artwork connected to science. Okay, How, um, what drew you to, to doing wood engraving? Uh, that's, I was very drawn to it. So I think it was the black and white nature of it, which is surprising seeing everything in the MPA show is, or most of it will be in color, but it was black and white. It was showing internal visions rather than external visions at that time. Darker, it was darker. It was working on a dark surface and cutting in, uh, as it's a relief print, you're cutting in lighter tones. So if you printed it, when you first started, you would get a black square. So you're, you're, it, it tends to have that darker, um, harsher, um, more dreamlike kind of feeling, at least for me it did. Wood, grave, wood engraving is a very old medium. Can you tell us a little about the history? Yes, uh, well, Durer was probably the best known, although his technique was not really, um, wood engraving, he was doing woodcuts and other forms of printmaking, but he did the, the very fine um, hand. Um, and uh, wood engraving itself is a British technique that was developed in the uh, 18th century. Uh, famous proponent is Buick, and it was um, done on hardwood. So it's done on hardwood rather than softer woods and it's done on the end grain. And it's usually a very small, tight medium. And so the fact that my work is now really large often and still has the intricate quality of wood engraving, and I still start everything as a wood engraving, almost everything, some as etchings, but most of them are uh, wood engravings. So um, it's, it's taking it further in that way and, um, and it's, but it's still con con connected very much to that very intricate, very um, internal. It's also the woodcut you can do without a printing press and you can hand rub. So it's got a practical and a very introverted feel to it that I think uh, attracts people who don't want to work in a large studio with a lot of other people on the, on the presses and wants to kind of turn inwards on this small piece of wood. And what would you say the difference is between woodcut and wood engraving? Uh, well, woodcut technically is done on soft, soft wood, and it's done with gouges. My tools are, here's a few little examples. So they're, they're more what a jewelry engraver would use. They are not gouges. They, are, um, they have to be sharpened very well, which um, the man, Barry Mosier, who taught me, we're always joking about that because... He always says he gives lectures and talks about the fact I do work that he likes very much, but I kind of sharpen my tools very well. But anyway, you have to sharpen your tools, and that's a bit, um, and they're they're these these little engraving tools, and so it's the wood is different being end grain, not here's a piece. Well, actually, this isn't a piece of wood. This is a piece of resin. So now it's very hard to get the wood that you need for wood engraving. And um, so they, they do have this new thing that's resin, which makes it almost like an, a linoleum, a sophisticated linoleum cut on, um, with no aspersion to linoleum cuts because they can be a star, uh, astonishing. But this is harder than most linoleum. So you'd use the engraving tools, but it's still um, not on wood anymore. I do still work on wood, but this, the practicalities make this a very good choice. So you you are known for your large work. What drew you towards working in that size as opposed to the traditional uh, smaller? Well, I used to do it small and I think it just, I got more and more like pushing, wanting to push, wanting to move in different ways. Um, uh, eventually I did a uh, project with, um, Arlington Art Center, where I had entered for one of their uh, slots being a 
for an, an individual show. And um, at the end of my presentation, I had a piece that was printed on Xerox machines. And, and I said, but you know, if you don't like this, you could also wrap your whole building in this piece. And they called me and they said, well, we sort of liked your other work, but when we showed this, all the jurors went, yes, so now you're a sculpture on the ground person. So I, all of a sudden I had this huge project wrapping the Arlington Art Center. And um, that sort of, that project changed my life because I'd never liked, for example, Christo particularly, but immediately I went and looked at what he did and, um, and started figuring out how to do something very much larger. And this was 15 feet by 300 feet. So it took me a year of working with them and um, raising the funding and doing all the parts to it, but it really changed my whole perspective. And so sometimes if you give an artist an opportunity to push in a new direction, if you trust them from everything they've done previously and you go like they did, yes, that's what we want, the sculpture on the ground. Um, I mean, I never thought I was a sculptor, but here I was doing the project. And um, so even though not everything I do now is 15 by 300 feet and the pieces on the MPA show are gonna be um, larger than engravings, but still you know, more in the four foot by five foot, something like that kind of perspective. Um, the, um, the, the start of thinking that there was no, um, there was no end to this. And then another thing that happened was I was throwing, as I did the hand rubbed pieces, I was rubbing the wood blocks and I was throwing the proofs on the floor. And my husband who was alive then, um, he, um, he came in and he would pick those up and he'd say, I love these proofs, which often had like, say I was engraving a head, it would have four heads on it because I was trying different things with how to rub it. And so that began to show me that I could move in a direction of rubbing and putting more things on a sheet than just the square that is the wood block, that you could play with that element. Um, so that's, that's where the two things come together and what you see in this show, the, the, the pushing forward. And I don't think that growth as an artist is something that one day you just get up and say, I think today I'm gonna, instead of working two inches by three inches, work 15 feet by 300 feet. I think that um, it's all a growth thing and a slow thing with a sudden push like the Arlington Art Center opportunity that gives you, um, it gives you some kind of leap forward. And um, then you just kind of know you feel the excitement and you move forward. Hey, that's, it's inspiration. It's something yes, happens. it's like you start feeling, yes. you know when you feel excited. I think if you, if you always go with where you feel excited, it will lead you to your yeah. next As direction. opposed to where you feel safe, yes. Right, and sometimes that's hard because you could be working on one piece and know that you're really just dying to do this other thing. And I, I say that when I, I don't teach that much, but when I suggest things to other people, I say go with the one that, you're excited about put aside the other one if it's not right. doing that for you. And then I often don't do it myself because you've invested time. And so I have to kind of remember back and follow my own advice um, because they, the, the whole thing is that makes work show excitement is that, ex that sort of little fire in yourself when you know, oh, this is it. <laughs> right, absolutely. So you do a lot of work with um, science. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, I, over the years, um, because of working in an open studio, I've had different people come in. So what I find is often whatever I'm working on, those people come in. It's like a magical thing. And, um, mm. and I think it's just because you're, you, the work is there, they're responding to it. So initially I was doing more medical related work. Um, actually a lot of things on reemerging diseases and plagues that now are very prescient. Um, but this was some years back. And so I started meeting medical um, health experts at that time who would give me ideas on that. And I pushed that more and more into my work. 
And then um, from that experience, um, I worked for three years with a guy who had a brain tumor on artwork connected to his Ooh. illness. But that led me to eventually just wanting to work with other people who would spur these ideas. So a lot of the work in the MPA show is um, I've been working with um, a expert on lichens and an expert on um, fungus and um, uh, environmentalists of different sorts to help me. They, I don't ever consider it's um, science art in form of um, science illustration. It's more that they allow me to, firstly, they are so excited about their work. I, I just had a show at Morton Fine Art in DC where we included the words of, um, of the scientists because I sent them all a, pic, a question, the ones I'd worked with, that said, what made you so happy and excited about lichens? What made you so happy, interested in um, space? What made you so interested in, um, in becoming uh, in, in, interested in fungus? And they had wonderful, wonderful answers. And their passion showed through in their answers. And so this became part of the show, was what they had to say about those subjects. But really, they just lent their enthusiasm to me and gave me um, one of the, the, the young woman who's at, um, well, she's now a graduate. She was, also, I worked with an, uh, I'm sorry, I always forget the science names when I'm doing things like this. But she was an insect specialist. Um, Oh, um, sorry. But um, she gave me her, even her high school butterfly collection so that I could study it and work, work on it and helped me tremendously because she got so excited that I was showing insects not as beautiful creatures, but in battered and um, possibly even dying. And she said, that's how as scientists, they see them. And she said that they have to, in order to study, they have to kill hundreds of insects, which are what they love. And so it was really beautiful to have them have the second life in artwork. And so things like that just mean a lot to me and kind of give me energy and give me ideas. The, the lichen specialist um, said to me, she was telling me about a type of, uh, actually it was the fun, fungus, um, scientist. She said that um, there was um, a, a, a fungus called witch's butter and she started explaining it to me and the jelly-like feeling of it and I just, the, the name, everything, it's just like wow that's, that's going to lead to something and um, that piece is in the MPA show. Um, I, it, it led me in a whole new direction. It's a very abstract piece but I just love the um, the jelly, how do you show jelly, <laughs> you know, and, um, and also witchiness. And so just little things like that. So I'm not a scientist, as you can see, I'm very, I, I draw loosely, but um, it's, it's a mutual pleasure. And usually the scientists, uh, well, most cases have become my friends and um, people I admire. And I, at the moment, I'm working with a guy on depression, on a book on depression. Um, he's, um, um, he, he, so we're working on that, and that's the current project. Well, it's so exciting what you're doing, and I think it'll illuminate the way people can look at the work on your website. I think that to understand this about you and about your process is going to be just wonderful for people. So I thank you very much for this chance to have an interview with you. <laughs> okay. sure. Thank you. Um, and I encourage everybody to go to your website and really look at what you're doing. Thank you very much, Rosemary. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to Vicki Stricker, a terrific potter. And so, Vicki, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Oh my gosh, I have the, um, <laughs> I don't have a very traditional road to where I'm at. Um, 
I started, actually, I started um, pottery in 2007. I was working at the time as a health and PE teacher for Arlington Public Schools. Um, and I've been teaching for about, I don't know, 2007, a mm, few years, several years. And I had just been taking classes for fun at Nova, the Alexandra campus. Um, and so I had, we've been taking a bunch of fun classes and I just always have loved pottery. Um, if I go to craft shows, I'll just go to the potters instead of the jewelers. And then, so before I decided to spend a little more money on, on um, a class at Nova, I talked my husband into taking a wheel class with me at Audrey, Audrey Moore in um, Fairfax through the Parks and Rec. So we took a Sunday class, never been on the wheel, because when I was in high school, uh, it was the only time I had ever taken art, and we didn't, back then, we didn't have a pottery, you know, ceramic class. So it was my first time. My husband is an engineer. He does a lot of um, his hobby is, you know, home improvement. So he's very, he uses his hands a lot. So we take our class and he, you know, it's like a very small community class on a Sunday afternoon. Our teacher was great. And um, she was explaining, you take a chunk of clay, you put it on the wheel and you let it spin and you just center it, right, with your hands. And I was like, all right, it looks simple. I mean, <laughs> it was like a disaster. It was very hard. It's really hard, and I think yeah. people will be like, oh, I could just make a little bowl or a cup. But anyway, so it took me a while. Of course, my husband gets it right away. He's <laughs> centered. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> making me had stronger hands, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. But eventually, eventually I got it, and that was like my, I had turned, I was turning 40, and it was, it was like his birthday present for me to take this class with me. So I'll always remember, and then, I just got hooked. I just love the feel of clay and I was, I love the wheel. There's something mesmerizing about the, it's, it's, you're, it's spinning, right? And you're trying to create and make something with your hands while this, this clay is spinning around. So what do you do where you're actually, where actually something is constantly moving? Like, you know, you know, and I was just like, this is wild yeah. stuff. Um, so, you know, then later that, at the end of that session, I just immediately signed up for NOVA. They have a ceramics, a great ceramics program. And I was just very fortunate because it's a, Bill Schran was my teacher at the time. And he is now retired, but he kind of started the whole program there in Alexandra campus on the ceramics program. And with him and a couple, couple of assistants there and all the you know we had students from all different ages and people who were retired people mm -hmm. who so it was just a he built a great community and I was there I was teaching I was there at night and on the weekend whenever I had time and um I it takes a few years for you to get really decent on the wheel I mean I didn't really and I think, and now that I teach ceramics at, um, in Vienna through the, their community parks and right, um, I look back and I realize as a teacher, you kind of need to know where your student, where they, they're, where they're headed, what's their objective for taking the class. And I look back and my objective was not to make a lot of pots for use at home. Like, which is a lot of my students, you know, which is actually so much fun to do. But my objective at the time was just to get really good at the wheel. I was just obsessed with it. Yeah. I was obsessed with the form. I was obsessed with the traditional classic form and just being able to master the wheel. That was my obsession. So, um, at the time, Bill had started, he was teaching some crystalline classes. And when I first started, I was not good enough. I mean, I could have taken it, but my forms, I felt, was not worthy of uh, all the work you have to do to do crystalline glazes. So I kind of waited, and it was like until his, it was like a, a couple of years later when I got pretty decent. 
I took one of his crystalline glasses and that was, that was the end. I mean, I was obsessed with this glaze because there's, there's so, so many beautiful different those glazes. Oh my God, I can't, it's insane. So there's so many techniques that you, he took us to, you know, there's Raku, there's regular glazes. There, there's so many things you can do with clay and glazes that it's endless. But at some point I had to, I had to like, something i was waiting for something to call me and say okay this is where you're going because i could not just keep doing a gazillion things um and when i took the class i followed his instructions and some people were successful some people weren't and i just it was like i i don't i can't describe he still remembers when i first had my crystalline firing i opened the camp and I'm like, oh my God, this is insanely beautiful. I did a dance and I was like, I can't, you know, so I kept at it. And a year or so later, I was working and I was a health and PE teacher. I was teaching elementary school kids. I was on my feet. I was constantly thinking about crystalline and what, you know, what glazes I was going to make. And, the, and I had some, you know, I was going through some health issues and I just didn't have the energy that I, sh I needed to give back to the students. You're running around with the kids. You're trying to get them excited. And I just said, I told my husband, I was like, you know, it's been five. That was, this was in 2012. So it was like five years after I had my first class. And I said, I can't, I need to, um, you know, I think we're doing okay. I've been working for a long time. We have a lot of money saved. I said, I need to, I need to quit this great job I have. <laughs> right. you know, everyone thought I was crazy. My family was like, what? Um, this secure job. And I did, I said, I, I need to do this. It's kind of crazy, but I need to do this. And my husband being the engineer and so practical, he goes, I think it's great. I think you're ready. I support you but you need to give me a plan. <laughs> he said, I need kind of a business plan because he says, what's going to happen is you're getting to a point where you can just crank, make pots. You can throw what you want. You're going to make a lot of pots. What, I don't want this house to be a gallery, just a, you know, just full of your pots. Um, what are you going to do with all these pots? <laughs> so, you know, so that takes some thinking and I, Love going to the torpedo factory right, in Alexandria, the art center. And I went there and I was looking at, I talked to some of the potters there and they're just, a, I love the pottery community because it's just a great bunch of really friendly down to earth right. people. And so I was talking to, I went into scope gallery and um, I talked to one of the people there and I said, so what, you know what's the deal here I see there's a bunch of artists and so she gave me the scoop and said you can join one of the two clubs that um that share scope gallery so that's what I so that was my goal so I set my goal two-year goal to <laughs> get I good I ask you yes do you I see you have a lot of your pots there do you have any with the crystalline glaze on it Yes, I do. You can show. Um, I have. Okay, I have. So this is one of the pieces that will be. I don't know if I. I can't see my stuff well. So do you need a closer look? At, yeah, that's good. The closer you get, the better it is. Okay, here, here. But I have the sun. Is there too much? So you can see. Yeah, the, that's great. There's, Thank you. Those, I want to see more. how beautiful the glaze is. There's a beautiful form, too, I want to say. Thank you. That's a Thank piece. you. Yeah, that's so that's, that's basically that's how to be, get started. Huh? That will be included in the MPA Art Fest? Yes, that's one of my 10. I'm still deciding on the that's 10, beautiful. but I have, yes. um, but I have, you know, I have, like, I have, this is it. I love this red Oh, that's beautiful. I know. It's just so... That is so with, beautiful. The thing with crystalline is that the colors are endless because it's, it's, um, 
It's the oxides, the colorants that I use, and it's the percentage. So I have just, I feel like I'm just beginning to get the colorants because, I mean, I can, you know, this is, this is my collection that I'm keeping because I got, so I can isolate and just get like a bunch of crystals right there. Wow. And then the rest, there's a few crystals here, but the rest is just by itself. Um, or do you I can have a kiln at home? Hmm? Do you have a kiln at home? Yes. I have got it. Oh. Thank goodness I got a kiln. I was so, I was say I've been at, um, so I finally got into scope and I saved up money and I, my husband, and luckily I became, when I quit my job teaching, I became an assistant, a volunteer assistant for Bill at Nova. So basically I don't get paid. I help make lasers. I help load. I help with students, but then I get to use the studio. Yeah. Right. And at the time I didn't have a kiln or anything. So I was working with Bill and doing my own thing and then helping out um, on the side. And he taught, he's like, what, what, what's your goal? Do you want to just be, do you want to just throw, make things, or do you want to learn the ins and outs of being a potter? Are you going to eventually own your own kiln? And I say, yes. So he, you know, he had me pugging, he had me get down and dirty and I took kilns apart. I, you know, so eventually, um, Five years later, because I really wanted to save money and use the money that I had made from my pottery and to buy my own kiln. So in 2018, um, I purchased a brand new kiln. And so I have my own kiln. I know, I was so excited. I have my own kiln in, the, in our shed outside. And then I have a wheel, which it's actually a, a friend of mine, but she um, is lending it to me because she just had two kids, so she doesn't have time. To do it. But yeah. eventually, I'll get my own kill. I mean, my own wheel. And then I had bought all the chemicals. So my basement is where I do all my. Um, I make all my glazes, and I do it there, and then I fire, and then yeah. So everything is done here in the house. That is wonderful. It's probably pretty wonderful during this period of time when you can't go out. Yeah, it was actually hard. I wasn't in, I mean, my art is, so I make this stuff to celebrate and to connect with others, right? I, you know, a lot of potters have stories to tell or they're making, and for me, I have lots of stories, but I really don't, I, I just want to, share the beauty of crystal and glazes so when this all this happened it was it took me it took me a, cut, a month or so to kind of just get back on the wheel because I didn't it was it was a dark time it was hard for me to see why why do I need to make beautiful you know like what am I going to do with these things people are losing jobs and they can't so it was hard but eventually my husband like kind of pushed me and I got back on and I you know once I started throwing again and making and firing I felt better and then I went online and didn't you know started a website I'm not a very good salesperson but I, get, I got a website I'm like the worst salesperson so I got a website just to get my stuff out there and then you know going online and looking for online opportunities and this is how this is my first time with um you know the arts festival and um i'm just super excited that it's online because i have not i haven't really done an, a festival an in-person festival well i think the people who come to mpa art fest are going to be so excited to go online and to look at your work because i went online and looked found your website and oh, I work is so beautiful and the crystalline glazes I've never seen anything like that I think they're so beautiful Thank so you. Yeah. it's going to be a great pleasure for everyone to be able to see them and I really appreciate your talking with us and telling us about what you do and I so encourage everybody to go look at your work online and in person and to purchase it I mean because it's it's wonderful, beautiful work, and I think it will bring people such pleasure to have one of your pieces. 
Thank you. I really appreciate it because it does take, um, you know, it's a lot of chemistries involved, the fire. It's just not, yeah. So for me, and then every piece is totally an original piece because I cannot, the crystals grow. So I, I did have, so this is what, so when I make the glazes and I, I hand pour, this is what it looks like before it's fired, mm. right? have to have a catcher and a biscuit to catch the glaze because the crystals grow when the glaze is running and seeds form. And then you hold it for five or six hours and the seeds attract uh, the right minerals to make the crystals. So basically when you glaze it, it looks like this. And I'm just standing with my music brushing on the glaze. And then when you fire it, I control everything until it goes in the firing. I can, you know, I, I control the, the schedule. But when it fires, this is the same blaze, but here's a pot that I made with it. So it comes out and where the crystals grow, I have no idea where it's going to grow. But I have, per, I, ha I am using a liner glaze in parts where the crystals aren't growing because I'm like, I'm just doing different things. I love experimenting and exploring. And this glaze, this crystalline glaze, it's just endless. You, eat. so I'm just super excited because it's um, it's a lot of chemistry, which I love. It's a lot. It's being accurate. It's being patient, and um, and then and it's just totally being organic because I, the kiln and what it what the what the crystals do in the kiln during the firing is what makes me the artist because I consider myself like well, I sure. my it's been able to incorporate it's been able to incorporate the accident into the piece of and to accept the accident when it happens right. so that's that's a wonderful thing well thank you so much thank you. for talking with us it has thank been a you. really, really a great pleasure it. and it's I hope everyone fun. does go to see your work and appreciate it. Thank and I want to thank everybody who tuned in today to see the work of these two wonderful artists. Um, we had Rosemary Faith Covey, and we just had Vicki Stricker, and they're both wonderful artists. Please go to their artist um, section of the website where this work is available. And thank you very much for tuning in to the MPA Art Fest Artist Talks. <laughs>